Welcome, everybody. Oh, so many good friends, so much to talk about, and now a lot to listen to. I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal people of Central Australia who we share our lives with, who we're honoured to know better than most people get to know Aboriginal people in other places. So I want to acknowledge that, that a gift to all of us. Um, in putting together the program this afternoon, I'm mindful that each person here could fill this whole session of two hours. It's very hard, really, to condense big lives into 20 minutes. So in the, in the sense of being fair to everybody, we are going to set the time at pretty close to 20 minutes for each of the speakers and just give them the heads up about five minutes before that. But if we say 25 minutes is a max, then we're going to get to hear everybody. So thank you very much to Marg Friedel, to Orsa Otterson, Julia Burke and Marcus Williams for being the rich stories that we're going to hear this afternoon. This is an event now that Friends of Araluan have been putting on for the last few years. And I think it's testament to how much we enjoy it, the crowd of you here this afternoon. And all lives are really valuable and knowing more about the people who we live alongside, I think is a real privilege and a great opportunity. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for Friends of Araluan, particularly Lizzie and Anita running their legs off at the bar and uh, making sure that it all goes smoothly. So thanks everyone. Marg Friedel, probably not a stranger to most of you. 50 years of really wonderful guiding and important work in Central Australia for, yeah, 50 years. It's quite remarkable. So to honour you, Marg, and thank you. It's over to you. Thanks. <laughs> I think I know where that came from. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going to tell the story of becoming a, an arid lands ecologist or becoming a scientist. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the influences um, on me that uh, made that come about and then some of the things that I got up to. Not all of them, but some. <laughs> Oops, too many. So starting at, almost at the beginning, um, I was the youngest of four girls. Um, unusually, perhaps, both my parents went to university, and that was in the 1930s. Um, and, of course, my mother, as soon as she married, she had to give up every, all her work and become a housewife. So I'm very glad that doesn't happen now. Um, but not surprisingly, there was an expectation that we'd all go to university. Uh, because that was the atmosphere in the house, and, and we all did. Um, so that was a very important um, early influence. Um, my sisters um, studied the arts, um, history, languages, um, uh, arts administration. Both my parents were arts graduates, uh, but so, uh, somehow at the age of 11, I know I was quite determined I was going to be a scientist. Um, no idea what that meant, I suspect, but uh, I did. Um, where did that interest come from? Um, possibly a couple of things. The family farm on the Nornington Peninsula. Um, so we were in, the, in those days, that was the bush. Um, we spent quite a lot of time there. And uh, the other was that, um, other aspect of the bush was the beach, because we lived, when we were in the city, we lived um, on top of a cliff um, above the beach. And my little school friends and I, we would pot around the beach as, whenever we had time. And there was no stranger danger then, so that was okay. Um, I, was, I was encouraged, uh, despite everybody else's interest in, not in the sciences particularly, I was um, encouraged. And I remember being given a child's microscope, and I used to climb up the side of the, one of the tanks at the farm and scrape the algae out and put them under the microscope. I loved it. <laughs> 
Um, so I went on to do a degree in science, um, botany and zoology. Um, and then, uh, then I went on to, uh, to do a PhD. I wore a funny hat. Um, and uh, the PhD was about, um, about fo it was a forestry, uh, uh, an applied topic about why when you replanted old soils for pine plantations, used that soil again, the pines didn't do so well. And the focus of that was nutrient cycling to try and understand if there was some sort of loss of nutrients. Um, and uh, it was a man's world, spot the odd one out. <laughs> it, was, it really was a, um, a, a strange time to be trying to get into this kind of world. Uh, it was a 1971 forestry conference. Um, but uh, after, um, uh, but I was towards the end of my time at the botany department at Melbourne Uni, and one of my fellow students came to me and said, "You've got oh, I've been given, I've been awarded a postdoctoral fellowship to the pine plantations of um, New, of New Brunswick in Canada, and uh, and I had time to fill in." And he said, uh, "I've got been offered two jobs, and I can only take one." He said, "You've got six months to spare, and Melbourne Teachers College are really stuck." Um, can you, would you like to go over and talk to them about possibly helping out? Um, so I did. Um, I went over to see, um, to see uh, the head of the department. It was a primary school, a primary teacher's department. Um, and the job was to teach trainee teachers how to live in the bush. Um, so there I went um, to Nuji, which is in the foothills of the Borbors uh, in Gippsland. And we lived um, in, in tents, um, army tents, staff and students. Um, and we taught the students uh, about living in the bush, co cooking over campfires. We, uh, we did a lot of bushwalking. Um, that's up, up in the high country in the Borbors. But we, there were a lot of um, old timber railways um, from the, the, the 1930s and later. Um, and we were fortunate to have an old forester who, he was a blacksmith too, and he used to love coming and talking to the students. Um, we had people um, who could talk about arts activities in the bush, and then they had me talking about science and what you could do with students. In, and uh, it, was, it, was a good, it was good fun, but, the, but you'll see um, from that, um, that uh, it's, a, it's a cold place. And most of our teaching time was in the cooler weather. And it rained and rained sometimes. Um, so after about three years of living in tents, lots of cold and wet, um, I was ready for somewhere warmer. And so I applied for a job with CSIRO in Alice Springs. And uh, here I came into, and I couldn't believe my eyes because of the color of the country. And of course, it's fantastic. So I was interviewed for a job with CSIRO in, in April 74, and I arrived in Alice in late 74. And I was very lucky to meet my beloved Dick Kimber, and we married in 75. Um, so the first project I was involved with um, was looking at using my nutrient cycling experience, plus looking at plant productivity decomposition rates um, in different kinds of country. Um, woodlands, open woodlands, mulga shrublands, Mitchell grasslands, and looking at sites that had already been selected on the basis of their, the composition, species composition of that plant, the plant, the ground layer. Um, and they were supposed to represent different states, different states of health or condition of the country from good to medium and then poor. Um, and so I set about doing this work and was very disconcerted to find that I couldn't find any relationship between all the things I was measuring and the apparent condition of these sites. And thought, oh, I failed. Um, and a wise head of mine said to me, Mark, did, did it ever cross your mind that it might be that the site selection was done, the wrong, was, not, was not correct? And I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that, that was an important lesson for me, that, that um, you, to question, to make sure that you question everything um, when you're doing something like this. Um, from there, um, I studied uh, 
the, the, tree, the, the population dynamics of trees and shrubs, because that was a very wet time. You probably remember, those of you old enough, um, that the 70s were extremely wet, and a lot of those tree and shrub populations around here just exploded. Um, and, and, we, and there are other places where it didn't happen. And, uh, and so the thing that followed from those rains, as it inevitably does, was fire. So that was another topic that I ended up studying um, with Graham Griffin, for those of you who remember Graham. Um, and uh, I think um, the... Uh, and, and then, sorry, and then I should uh, put in here that in uh, 19... In the early 1980s, 1980 and 1983, our son and daughter, Bar uh, Steve and Barbara, Barbara's here today, um, and, um, were born. And Dick, as far as we know, um, became Alice Springs' first house husband. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I went on from there to study much more complicated um, much more complicated stories about how landscapes work. And this was something that was growing in the, in the whole lab, not just with me. Um, it was uh, because remote sensing was possible and you could look at country from, with satellites. Um, you could see the distribution of vegetation and, and patches in it, which were all important in how, how um, vegetation works. So I was looking at grazing gradients uh, out from watering points on a scale of kilometres. Uh, as opposed to the, the much smaller metre square quadrats and all that sort of, although we still use them. Um, so uh, to understand how things change, the redistribution of water in the landscape, erosion, where the products of erosion ended up, um, water infiltration, all manner of things. And I've just got a whole raft of little pictures here of some of the things that we did. And one of the important points to make here is there's lots of different people in those pictures, and um, teamwork's uh, a fundamental part of, of science. Um, we did many things, and uh, uh, including stuff I've already mentioned, uh, looking at also at things like the rates of collapse of, of soil fragments to tell us how erodible soil is, what the soil seed banks were doing, all these, all these kind of things to get a bigger picture of how how the landscape worked. But one of the, t the topics we got involved with was rehabilitation and how effective that was when you had very degraded country. Uh, and, uh, and we were lucky because the work had already been done at the airport and also on, um, on a lot of, of pastoral properties. And people were very welcoming. We were very fortunate, really, to um, have people who were interested, and in particular, one experience was quite formative, although it probably didn't seem so significant at the time. But Dick Cadso was uh, taking me around, showing me some of the ponding banks he'd been building on Mount Riddick. And I said to him, probably fairly naively, oh, I suppose that means that um, it makes economic sense to do this, that it makes money, you get more, more cattle growing, you know, better growth, all that sort of thing. He said, mm, yes, but he said, it also offends me to see dust blowing past my door. And that, that was saying to me, when I'm thinking about the relevance of what I do, I have to fit that in with people's values. That, uh, and it's not just economic values, it can be social and cultural values as well. So that, that really was a bit of a watershed moment for me, um, which, which you'll see developed further as time went by. Um, but. We were, um, I was very lucky I, to get a fellowship uh, to work in South Africa for a time. Um, wonderful experience. The whole family came. Um, and uh, I have to once again acknowledge uh, Dick and, and uh, how much he put up with sort of helping me to do these things. Um, we, were, we were working in the Transvaal um, and now Gauteng. Uh, and it was, a, it was a pretty interesting time. Well, not so... It was, Bit of an awkward time to be there because apartheid was in full swing, uh, P.W. Borta was in power, and it was uncomfortable sometimes. But it was also fantastic and lots of wonderful people, lots of terrific experiences. And I've been lucky enough to get back in the post-apartheid era, era too. Um, but in 19, then it, after that, um, came back here, continued with what I'd been working on here. And but in 1988, I attended the International Rangelands Conference in New Delhi. 
And uh, as part of that, I went on a post-Congress tour to Rajasthan. And uh, there uh, we, we were taken on the most amazing trip. And one of the key people there I met was a man called Dr. Suresh Kumar. And uh, that name will, will come back well, into the story a bit later. He was based at the Central Arid Zone Research Institute in Jodhpur. But uh, my work gradually shifted um, to the sort of things that I've been, I've, I had alluded to before, much more to do with working at the interface between people and the biophysical stuff. And, uh, and I got involved in a project called Rangeways with West Australian colleagues, um, which was an attempt to get communities talking about how to trade off different types of country for different land uses. So we developed a community group, which they, to a quite a large extent, ended up controlling themselves. Um, they made a bit of a mistake in that they, um, they said uh, they didn't want government involved, which, uh, because they didn't want to be told what to do. Um, but trying to make decisions about land use without government is probably a bit unwise. But we made mistakes too, in that we used this very um, complicated bit of software to try and quantify these trade-offs. And it was so complicated that it, the whole thing really struggled. But um, interestingly, because we began to get some traction, um, first of all, the chairman of, our, of this community group, who was a really good man, he worked for Western Mining and they sacked him because he was too interested in regional development. And I think they were worried about this potential shift in power and control. And also one of the members, um, not, it wasn't a pastoralist, uh, he, he was um, disgruntled and went to his minister and the minister stopped the project which was a pretty interesting lesson it had to do with the way we went about it, which probably wasn't the right way, and also um, this fear that people have of losing control. Um, now, I won't, I won't go on to that. I think we're too short of time. I, I did work at Uluru in the mid-'90s. Um, but then um, Suresh came back into the picture. Suresh Kumar approached our lab and said, uh, because of the work that was being done on remote sensing, um, not by me, um, but by others, um, that he, he wanted to use our technologies to, um, to assess the degradation in the Tar Desert, which is out in the northwest towards the Pakistan border. Um, and uh, it, it ended up becoming um, much more uh, richer than that, uh, because we went to, uh, I ended up leading the project, but not because I knew about remote sensing, but I had Gary Baston and Vanessa Chewing very much involved, and they, um, but, but ACR, Australian Council for um, International Agricultural Research, said if, you're, if we fund you, you've got to make this much more integrative than that. So if you Look, and I, no, you probably can't see it, it's probably a bit dim, but down the bottom left-hand corner there are three people sitting on little frames um, having a cup of chai on a, in a little village, and they were Dr Usha, who was a, a, an economist with the World Bank, Dr Saha, was, um, he was a demographer, and the man in the white shirt, Dr Matu, was a, a livestock specialist. So we had all this different expertise working together, and it was a fabulous experience, frustrating sometimes, but nevertheless, it was um, pretty good. At, um, by the time that was winding up, um, I inherited uh, a Desert Knowledge Project because the Desert Knowledge Cooperative Research Centre had uh, begun by then. Um, and it was a, another study of community involvement. This one to do with tourism and developing tourism industry in Central Australia. It was thinking about it as a whole system. What were the things that influenced it? Um, what what might provide positive feedbacks, all this sort of thing. And so the people who were leading it at the, the start of, of the project uh, had community groups that were um, thinking about all those influences and then it, it possibly, I don't know what you can see, but there's a whole lot of little stickers and lines and everything connecting everything. And then Vanessa um, put them together as a, as a computer, com, into a model um, on, her, on the computer, and she was able to then hand that along and uh, the community group came back and tested this model using different scenarios. Um, but um, 
despite all the, the goodwill from everybody, um, it was an absolute failure because there simply wasn't enough data in this in this community to be able to use the models effectively at all. And uh, so it was, was not my finest hour, but I think it's an important illustration of how science doesn't always work the way you want it to. And, uh, and you, you have to uh, learn something from that. Um, then again, serendipitously, um, somebody in Desert Knowledge CRC had a project on buffalo grass and they left. So I inherited that. Um, and, uh, and as we know, the top two pictures, I suppose, I might attempt to illustrate that the contentious issues of buffalo grass in, in uh, conservation areas as opposed to buffalo grass and its ability to help stabilise soil and improve animal production. Um, and we also know that it came in with the camels and, and as I've found out since, um, a lot more about how it was distributed through Australia. But the West Australian Department of Agriculture spread it to um, all the agricultural departments in the north of Australia and also to botanical gardens in Sydney and other places, fascinatingly. <laughs> um, uh, so the thing that I suppose I would like to just highlight there is represented by that picture of the two ladies there. We ran projects, um, uh, community groups in four places, in Rockhampton, in Alice Springs, at Port Augusta and in Dampier, and ask pastoralists and conservationists to sit down together um, and first of all talk about where they saw the, the threats and the opportunities and also um, what they thought about potential solutions to what some of these problems were. And, and I think encouragingly we found a lot of consensus amongst people which you don't really get to hear when there's just a um, an, an a sort of adversarial debate and an advocacy going on that you don't really get to appreciate the fact that a lot of people can, can acknowledge each other's points of view and have interesting things to say. Um, Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Um, and uh, across the bottom, I've got a picture there of quite a lot of other invasive plants. So that's where a lot of my work went. Um, quite a few other things were happening too. But this is, I'd been the officer in charge for, uh, from 2002 to 2009 and just found the burden uh, made doing anything fairly challenging. So eventually I asked if I could be relieved of that post and I stayed on for another year. Um, just writing, um, and then I re retired, um, but, uh, but CSIRO was very good to me, and they gave me another nine years as an honorary fellow, where I went on writing up a lot of this work and continuing to develop new things that didn't involve money, but just involved writing. Um, and, uh, and also, um, eventually, I outlasted CSIRO. Um, <laughs> 2019, I finally was invited not to apply for my fellowship again because so the lab here had closed the year earlier. But I was very lucky that, um, um, the, uh, that Charles Darwin University had also given me um, an honorary fellowship, which I still have, and I still go on writing there, which has been terrific. Um, then, um, the last story I would like to tell just very briefly is, is as part of, while I was uh, being an honorary fellow, um, Jane Addison came to me and said, I, would, I want to work in Mongolia um, and uh, I want to look at herder livelihoods. And, and, and in the, I ended up among, with others supervising Jane's PhD where she was looking at what's called the institutional settings which means policy regulation and how that affected the herder livelihoods in the Gobi Desert and also um, how that then reflected in the condition of the country. So you can sort of see connections between things I've told you about already I think. Um, but it was just the most amazing experience just driving across the Gobi and stopping respectfully at a respectful distance from a, a gear um, and uh, waiting for the people to come out if they were there um, and we just we sort of met with people who were from extremely well to do people to, to the poorest of the poor and it was just such a privilege and I'm going to leave it there um, just to reflect back on the, on being 11 years old and thinking I was going to be a scientist and having no idea where, where that might take me and how many 
good people that would uh, that would be important on that journey. So I just uh, really want to acknowledge uh, my family who've been fantastic supporters, and uh, and also to so many good um, work colleagues and friends. So thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Thanks again. And just to acknowledge Dick Kimber too, the long-term partner. We know, yeah. those, those of us who have survived long-term relationships know that this kind of work doesn't happen without two people really giving over to it. So I like to acknowledge all the long-term relationships and especially Dick and Marg for being both so productive in supporting each other and expressing themselves over many years. Really valuable, thank you. Uh, so Marcus Williams has he's had a little um, introduction really to reflecting on his life because Ernie Dingo's been here wanting his story. And we'll all get to see that next year sometime. But um, it's, it allowed Marcus to do the reflecting that is really valuable and important to do and always something we plan to do, but we don't always get around to doing it. Anyway, Marcus Williams is another one of the unique individuals in Central Australia. He's a camelier. He's got a big story too, and we make him very welcome. Thanks a lot. Hello. <laughs> Actually, I'm not even going to worry about my notes. I tend to do this um, better around a campfire, <laughs> as some of you may have experienced in the past. So. Um, how do I do this? Left or forward? Put it, put it, the right Oh, there you go. There's me when I was a little kid. Uh, I was born in Frankston, Victoria. Um, I grew up um, and uh, unfortunately for my family, my father was a little bit abusive. So um, my mother ended up kicking him out when I was about eight years of age. And, um, <clears throat> and then uh, after a while, Frankston became a little bit too violent for um, my, my mother to sort of bring up six children. So um, we ended up moving to Ballarat in Victoria, where I went to high school. And um, living in government housing estates, a pensioner, and once again, six kids. So life at home wasn't necessarily too good sometimes. Um, <clears throat> fortunately for me, my mother was an extremely intelligent woman. She was well read. She um, had a lot of empathy towards other people. She didn't understand the word no. It was always a yes. I always felt loved by my mother. She was one of my closest friends. And um, <clears throat> when I was about 17 years of age, her second cousin came over from England. And he was a young English bloke traveling the world. He was 28 years old. He traveled through Africa, South America, Asia. And he sat there telling me stories about his adventures. So I thought, wow, I want to, I want to do this. I um, <clears throat> wasn't very good at school. So I left school at a young age. I left school when I was 15 years of age. I went back to school when I was about um, 16. Met this fella. I left school again, saved up $400, bought a backpack, and I started hitchhiking. My mother dropped me off in the outskirts of town. Bless her heart. I don't know what was going through her head when she was dropping off her 
young son. I'd just turned 18 years of age. And um, I travelled up through New South Wales and through Queensland. I, um, I was always interested in going to sea, you know, as a deckhand or something like that, working on a fishing boat. So I stuck to the coastline, chasing a fishing job. Never landed one, really, um, not until a couple of years later. Anyway, in Central Australia, I got a job in, um, in this mining company. They were building this new mining town. And I'd hitchhiked from Townsville. I just heard about this area, and this person said to me, just go out there, young fella, you know, you'll get a job, no problem. So I started hitchhiking out towards central Queensland and I got picked up by this truck driver and he was on his way to a mining camp and I said, that'll do, you can drop me off there. So he ended up reluctantly, he said, yeah, okay, you know, I'll take you in there. And so he showed up quite late at night, it must have been about eight o'clock at night. Everybody was still having their dinner in the big dining hall and stuff. And so he sort of walked into this dining hall with me, carrying my backpack, and he pointed over to a table and said, see that table over there? And they're the bosses. Go have a chat to them. So I wandered over there with my backpack, you know, swung over my shoulder, and I approached this table, and these four guys just look at me and go, where do you come from? <laughs> you know, and uh, I said, oh, you know, I'm looking for a job. And they were quite surprised. And they said, you know, normally people apply for jobs, you know, in Brisbane. <laughs> And they were quite surprised that this young fellow had hitchhiked all the way out there and was standing in front of them saying, can I have a job? And um, fortunately for me, they actually did give me one. <clears throat> so they employed me and um, it was probably my first real job. Um, and then, unfortunately for me, um, the job that this company was was, um, was doing, they were building the roadworks and foundations for a new mining town. They'd lay, we'd laid fresh gravel on this big sweep and bend, this big road, and I was running an errand for the um, diesel mechanic. So I was driving this brand new ute that the bosses had just got for me to run errands in. And I ended up going too fast around this bend and I rolled it half a dozen times. The car just kept on rolling, rolling, and I'm sort of hanging on to the steering wheel and just watching the roof caving in on top of me. I'm thinking, I'm too young to die. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> anyway, the car landed on its roof, and all of a sudden, as I'm sort of halfway out the side window, crawling out of this car, there's these two blokes dragging me out. And these two guys were amazed that I was still alive. And um, anyway, you know, but I go back to the camp. The bosses hear about it. I've got to go see the bosses. My boss said to me, pulls out my application form. And he said, see where it says license number? Can you please write in four digits or six digits or whatever it was? Because I never had a driver's license they would have lost their jobs and you know, all sorts of things would have happened. Anyway, um, so I started hitchhiking again back to Victoria to um, recover from the traumatic experience of almost killing myself in a car at my mother's place in Ballarat. So I travelled back to Victoria, um, got over that, and then I found out that a friend was living over in Western Australia. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll stay hitchhiking to Western Australia. So I packed up my backpack again. I think I was at my mum's place for maybe two weeks. I get to, uh, I started hitchhiking through um, South Australia. And I was, up, I can't even remember where I was. I was out in the country somewhere. It was late at night. I was tired. I vaguely remember you know, walking over to a puddle on the side of the road and having a bit of a wash and um, finding a little dry spot underneath these trees to roll my swag out and well, 
not swag, but sleeping bag and have a bit of a, a, bit of a snooze. And then I, seen, I could hear this car coming in the distance and I could see the lights coming down the road and I just thought, oh, one more car. So I got up, stuck my thumb out and this old fella picked me up in this old ute and he said, you know, where are you going? This was maybe, I don't know, 8, eight o'clock, 9 o'clock at night or something. And I said, oh, wherever you're going. And anyway, he said to me, oh, do you want to spend the night at my place? And instinctively I go, oh, no, not another dirty old man. You know, I mean, I'd been hitchhiking for eight months or something like this. And on the odd occasion, you know, you get picked up by pretty interesting people sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> and so I was a little bit sort of, mm, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I said, yeah, OK. So I ended up going back to this, this fella's place. And it was an old church. And we drove around the back of this old church. And he swings these two double doors open. And you know, the headlights are shining up against this old building. And um, anyway, I, I go inside. And then I sort of start looking around the room and I could see all these paintings on the walls. And I seen this easel in the corner. And I said, oh, who's the artist? He goes, I am. I went, oh, OK. Anyway, this, this fellow, was, um, his name was Stan Humphreys. He was a South Australian artist. And he used to travel all over Australia doing landscapes and stuff. He was very good at it. And uh, he said to me, before you leave South Australia, you should go up to the, Kimber up to the um, Flinders Ranges. It's really beautiful. So I took his advice and I did. I was walking through the Flinders Ranges for a little while and I just thought, well, if this is what Northern Australia is like, I want to go there and you know, spend more time there. So after that, I hitchhiked over to um, Port Augusta. I stood at the crossroads from Alice Springs in Western Australia, you know, the one, service station around the corner, you know, we've all been there, <laughs> you know. And, um, I stood there and I closed my eyes and I just spun around in circles. Wherever I was facing was the direction I was going to go in because I couldn't work out Alice Springs, Western Australia. I went to Western Australia. So I showed up in Western Australia during the winter time in um, 1982. And um, unfortunately, I know southern South Perth around Margaret River is very beautiful, but I tell you what, when you hitchhike and during the winter time, it's miserable. You know, it's cold, wet. Anyway, um, a farmer, farmer and his uh, wife picked me up and they sort of said to me, oh, you should go further north, get out of the wet weather. So I did. So I started travelling up the west coast and eventually landed in Broome. When I was, um, <clears throat> I can't remember, it might, have, it might have been around Carnarvon area or something like that, I got picked up by this fella and it turned out that the guy that picked me up was the, shit, was the baker that was working in the mine camp that I was working in. And he picked me up and he goes, I remember you. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, um, so this fella sort of, you know, recognised me from the mining camp is this young fellow that rolled the car. He was, you know, nearly killing myself. Everybody knew about me. Um, anyway, so um, we got to Broome quite late at night and as we're going into, into uh, Cable Beach area, he's saying, you know, all the young people, like swag out over there in the sand dunes and, you know, there's a, a park ranger called Scotty you know, keep out of his way because, you know, he can be a bit, bit hard sometimes, but, you know, he'll come up to you and he'll tell you to move, and all you do, you just move over the other side of the sand dune. The following, you know, two or three days later, he'll come back again and tell you to move again. Don't argue with him. So I never did. Anyway, so he drops me off in the car park at Cable Beach and I wander over into the sand dunes, go to sleep, get up in the morning, and when he dropped me off, I noticed that there was like a little shop and a caravan park in this, you know, car park area. And um, so he drops me off. Still trying to work this out. No, there you go. He drops me off. Um, I get up. I walk over to the shop. 
for a carton of milk for breakfast. And as I sort of emerged out from the sand dunes and the, and the scrub, I could see these figures out front of this shop. And I didn't know what they were. And as I'm getting close, I'm thinking, oh, they're camels. And I didn't know there was camels in Australia until that day. I had no idea. Anyway, so I just stood there looking at these strange looking animals. And all of a sudden, this little fellow wanders out from a shop carrying a couple of sarongs filled up with whatever he had in his sarongs and um, started shoving these items into saddlebags. And he, um, he had six camels all sort of sitting in a straight line. He mounted the lead camel, gave the command, hut, and all of a sudden all these camels spring into the air. He turns the, cam the lead camel's head around and they start wandering down the beach. And I just followed behind him, looking, going, oh, this is really quite incredible, actually. And um, so I wandered back into the sand dunes and um, I start asking questions about this strange fellow with these strange animals. And people are telling me, you know, oh, his name's Kaz, he's got a camp down, down the beach, he's got a business, he takes tourists for camel rides, you know, he does day trips. Oh, yeah, okay. Anyway, three days later, I see this, this fellow again and his animal, animals in the same spot. And I'm standing there again watching him putting things into saddlebags. And I'm trying to work out how do you always say, can you teach me about camels? And you know, I'm just sort of making idle chit chat with him. And unfortunately for me, I made the terrible mistake and I called him a cowboy. <laughs> And he turns to me and says, Camel here, mate. OK. <laughs> and then, um, and now I'm just sort of trying to work out a way of, you know, asking him, can you give me a job? Anyway, he turns to me and said, would you like to learn about camels? And I went, yes, I would. He goes, OK, I can't pay you anything, but I can give you somewhere to live and I can feed you. Are you on the doll? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay, good job. A couple of days later, I'm at Kaz's camp. So this is me when I was 18 years old, in Broome, in the sand dunes, in a camp surrounded by seven camels. The young fellow there, his name's Marcus as well. So my friend Kaz came to Central Australia in the late, very early, actually it might have been about 79, and he walked camels from, Broome, from Alice to Broome with three children and his partner at the time, the youngest child was one and a half years old, and he um, stayed in Broome and set up a business there. And he was probably, he'd have to be one of the most influential Sorry, just getting a bit teary. <laughs> Kaz died a few years ago in Thailand. And um, so my days in Broome were probably one of the nicest days I've ever had, and well, you know, apart from Central Australia, of course. <laughs> um, no, Broome was very special. I, I learned a lot from, from Kaz living in his. Um, camp and hanging out with his camels and there's his camp there. So my friend Kaz lived like this for about, well pretty much the whole time that he was in Broome. He was there for more than 35 years and um, I don't remember the guy ever actually living in a house. In fact, I don't think he actually owned one. Five minutes. Um, anyway, I ended up um, leaving Broome and came to Central Australia in, for the first time in 1985. He encouraged me to um, go out to Kevin Pick's place out in Simpson Desert. Some of you people might, might know Kevin Pick out on the edge of Simpson on the other side of um, Santa Teresa. And I caught my first team of wild camels. During the um, 80s, my time in Central Australia wasn't really that good. It was really hard. I had lots of... Um, Bad things go wrong. I ended up um, 
leaving Central Australia for a few years, went back down south, and then when I was in South Australia, um, I decided to come back to Central Australia, so I started making more pack saddles. I decided to come back, get another team of camels together, and then go to um, Broome. But unfortunately, I decided to, well, actually I did, I went back to Broome for a very short period of time. Myself and a friend of mine came, were driving down the Tanamai Road, and um, we got to the other side of Uindamu, and I turned to my friend Dan Murphy and I said, I don't think I'm going to go back to Broome. I think I'll stay in Central Australia. So I decided to stay here, research camel business, and I eventually set one up, pinned down camel tracks. Back in the early days, for the first 12 months, I was walking my camels from the Transport Hall of Fame, Gan Preservation, into the Todd River, sitting out the front of, um, across from the town council and town library, sitting in the river and waiting for tourists to walk up to me and say, oh, can you take me for a camel ride? And um, so I did that for the first 12 months. Then I eventually um, met a beautiful lady, Julia Burke, and, um, and, set, and started slowly setting the camel business up. We eventually bought a property out at White Gums Station where we live today and have been out there for 20 odd years, about 20 years maybe. So the Pinhead Camel Tracks is, um, has grown over the years. I've always allowed it to naturally grow as a business, organic basically. <laughs> and um, I've been very fortunate to have met a lot of incredible people here in Central Australia who have opened up doors for me. Um, this is a shot that um, was taken when I took out some young crew from Bushmob. And we did a walk from Wallace Rock, Rock or from Alice Springs to Wallace Rock Hole. And um, this is a fellow that I met called Eric Sultan. We, there's Dave around here somewhere. We walked camels for the um, um, year of the Outback from Udnadatta to Alice Springs in celebration of the old Afghan Camelias. And um, Eric's a wonderful person. <laughs> I don't know what we're talking about there, but it must be something really interesting. <laughs> And um, this is my wife, Julia Burke, and my two great children. Alice Springs, for me personally, has, um, has been a great place to, to grow up as a young man and also to have a family. My oldest son is 18 years old, and I, I'm so proud and and I feel so lucky to have had my children grow up here. And, you know, they've ex just, you know, their experiences in Central Australia you can't have anywhere else, I don't think. You know, it's a great place to live. You know, we've all been out in the desert. We've all rolled our swags out. We've all smelt campfire smoke, you know, even though we whinge about it when it burns our eyes, we still enjoy it. I was sitting around a fire just last night with smoke blowing in my face going, oh, bloody thing, you know, but, you know, it's great, you know. And, um, and, you know, to roll your swag out at night time and to look at the big skies that we have here, the stars are incredible, you know, and the silence. And the only thing you can hear is just a mopoke in the distance, you know, and, uh, you know, it's quite incredible. And this is our backyard at the moment. I've been lucky enough to have spent the last 20 odd years walking camels through White Gum Station. And um, it's an incredible, you know, that whole valley has been always very special for me. I've, you know, the um, commonage, I was talking to somebody just before about a commonage. She also has a passion for the commonage. And, um, you know, it's always been a place for young cameleers like myself. There's been numerous camel people pull into the commonage. And, um, oh, whoops. <laughs> 
Anyway, I love Central Australia, always will, and um, I love the people that live here. That's me. Marcus, thanks. It was just really great. <laughs> could have gone on for days, I know. Really, you could have. So to be continued with anyone who wants to continue with Marcus, preferably out at Pindan Camel. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's just take a break, maybe 10 minutes, long enough just to grab a drink or have a stretch, whatever, and then uh, Julia the long-term partner and another powerhouse in the combination here with Marcus will uh, talk to us next. Thanks a lot. Are we pretty right? Right, thanks everyone. So, where's Marcus? <laughs> Julia Burke is long-term Central Australian as well. Wears many hats as a friend, as a worker, uh, somebody who's always expressing and doing, supporting, and a very active part of the successful Pindan Desert Tracks as well. So, a pleasure to introduce Julia. Thanks, everybody. Quite fitting that we start with this one because this is my backyard as well. <laughs> oh, there we go. So thanks everyone for coming today. Here we are on beautiful Aranda country, and I acknowledge that this land has never been ceded. I'm the youngest of five sisters from Sydney's Middle Harbour, specifically at Balmoral Beach which is a few coves around from Taronga Zoo in the suburb of Mossman. It's beautiful there, there's bush, there's sandstone, views out to Sydney Harbour through the heads, transports by ferry only six minutes or so from Circular Quay. My grandfather settled at Balmoral as a little boy out from Norway with his family before World War I. By the time I'm born, in the late 1960s, Mossman is increasingly blue ribbon liberal and privileged. But my parents were journalists, writers, an Antarctic explorer. They had friends who played jazz. And each parent, and each had a parent who was a performer one, a concert pianist, and the other sung opera with Nellie Melba. Except for being in the Catholic Mafia, our house was a bit more unconventional than the regular Mossman mould. Following a history degree at Sydney University, the third generation of women to go to Sydney University, and with no clear plan ahead, I fall into a job as a receptionist at a publishing house where my sister worked. I moved swift, swiftly along the ladder to become a coordinator of a series of natural history encyclopedias with names like oceans and rainforests. Those hardcover, large format books full of glossy photos. At home, we had a set in the bookshelf produced by Time Life. And it's here that I really first encounter the deserts of Australia. In the hundreds of hours I put into picture research with the scientists whose articles I pluck into plebeian language, the illustrations I oversee with props couriered to me such as spiky spinifex with their roots coated in red sand. And then by phone, when I was seeking photographic permission from an Aboriginal fella 
who I search for through community payphones and narky staff at health clinics. And all the time I'm thinking, what is going on out there? I fall head over heels in love with the central Australian desert I've never seen. I produced this book called Deserts with contributors such as Syro scientist Mark Stafford Smith and local legend photographers like Mike Gillam, Susan, Suzanne Bryce and David Haig. And then I decide I have to go and see Alice Springs. I arrive off the red class on the GAN, the old sit-up class. It's February 1994. And even though when I step off the train, it's like I've stepped into an oven, I get this overwhelming ability to breathe more fully. It's visceral and that big blue sky. On that holiday, David Haig took me for a drive out to Ross River. We eat dinner at the homestead, sharing an outside table with other random Alice people. And they swap stories about parenti encounters. I know then that I want to have these types of conversations. In Sydney, I was feeling so asphyxiated and lonely among the crowds. When we return to Alice from Ross River that night, Dave turns off the car lights and we drive by the full moon. I was like, oh my God, this is so exhilarating and invigorating. <laughs> 10 weeks later, I moved to Alice Springs with my dog. No job, no plan. It made sense. <laughs> Dave Haig had a spare room in Priest Street. I bumped into an acquaintance from school who was a Kalis lawyer. I was part of the Satchananda yoga group and I volunteer at the Alex shop opposite Swingers Cafe on Gregory Terrace. It's those thin threads of connection that weave me into a community. Week three in Alice Springs, as Jenny McFarlane's assistant in the company of Uendamu, Uendamu women, I arrive in the bush near Chukula on Ngānadara country for the Central Australian Aboriginal Women's Law and Culture Meeting organised by the Ngānadara Pithindara Yankindara Women's Council. Now, that was invigorating. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a sense of where I wanted to put my energies. By summer, I'd stumbled into a fill-in position at Muraku Arts and Crafts, living at Mudujulu. There I am at my little house in Mudujulu, the old police station. I was the acting manager at the Muraku shop near the park headquarters. Back in those days, a Wiltshire shade shelter made from spinifex and chicken wire with a red sand floor. Before I left at night, I raked the sand. Much easier to check for the snake tracks in the morning. A few older Pitindara ladies worked at Maraku making punu, and I really knew absolutely nothing. And they were kind, great teachers. I contact Maggie Kavanagh at the NPY Women's Council to see if there was any work I could do back in Alice. And one year after that holiday arriving off the GAN, I became the Women's Council's research officer. I made books and new newsletters, sourced funding, monitored grants, battled with state and federal bureaucrats and worked with my Aboriginal colleagues to ensure that they were able to operate programs in their own particular way, quite different from mainstream Australia. It's been very freeing working outside of my culture, as there are events, timeframes, protocols, understandings that I have absolutely no control over and just have to go with the flow. Frustrating as things may be at times, it's fun and never boring. Those next eight years at Women's Council grew me up. 
and I was taught to listen. The research was on the ground. It was not academic. The bush trips for hunting, visiting special places, singing and dancing, that was research. The bush meetings for women's council members to advocate for what they saw um, as the priority. More research. Researching with women how support could look, Anangul way. Listening to the directors and creating programs out of their visions. A type of intermediary between the women and government. All research. Writing funding submission after submission, after submission and seeing the Women's Council grow into the vision of the women for the old, for people with disabilities, the carers, the kids sniffing petrol, youth programs, start of Junpi enterprise, recognition of traditional healers, an investment in emotional and social wellbeing before it was considered essential. Here we are in the unnamed conservation park in the great Victoria desert. A, a trip which reunited families, women that had sisters that have been separated because of the Mar um, Maralinga bombing. Always alongside there was the dancing, the singing, the bush trips, the humour, the sadness, the friendship, the chaos the plans that change constantly. I'd grown up with sisters and been at girls' school for 10 years. Working with women made sense to me. And I could just talk about that today and all the mates who I've had adventures with. But anyway, uh, uh, by 2002, a new path appeared. I moved to PY Media and RA Eritija the then Pitindara Council's social history project. And it was 18 years before I'd returned to the Women's Council. But for a moment, let's return to 1998, and it was with one of these mates, where we caught sight of a spunky, salt-of-the-earth fellow who had camels. <laughs> that was Marcus. We ran into each other over the next few years before getting serious. And you can read all about our love story <laughs> in That's Life magazine. <laughs> Marcus and I bought our beautiful magical property out at White Gums in 2002. We married. There we are, getting married down there. In 2004, child number one, 2005, and child number two, 2007. When the kids were little, they'd have dinner down at the camels while I raked camel poo, waiting for the camels to come home from their sunset tour, and then we'd entertain the tourists while Marcus unsaddled the camels. Marcus had worked by himself for such a long time with a phone, a pen, a diary, and some brochures. As the world began to change on a digital scale, it became not so simple to run a business that way. So I began to get more involved in the back end in a part-time capacity. One of the most valuable outcomes for me working in tourism is seeing how well respected and loved my husband is. There are people all over the world that he's talked to and he's touched their hearts. Sometimes he comes home with stories like, today a young woman with a small kid came up to me in Coles and she said that she used to let me hold, her camel hold my camel's reins when I was walking my camels in the river and she was a kid living in the Todd with her family. People remember him. Marcus has done too many film shoots with too many famous people that we can't even remember all their names. And the thing about Marcus is that he's always his authentic self. And that's been a wonderful lesson for me. Working in tourism is a hard slog. 
For a few years, it's wonderful. Then there's an economic downturn or a virus. And since I've worked out who we are inside tourism, what we represent, which is our authentic selves, keen to share the beauty of nature, the amazingness of camels, the quietness and peace of being away from the humdrum. I've relaxed more into sharing our story. Marcus has always known who he is, and it's taken me much longer to understand who I am among this. In small business and tourism particularly, you must keep up to keep your share of the market. Advertising, website, Google Analytics, social media, insurance, finance, HR, trade, wholesalers, accreditation, booking system, and email automation. And I can feel overwhelmed and hate being consumed in such a mass market that I never have enough time to understand it all or do it because I still want to work alongside Aboriginal Australia. And that's a diametric opposition. As much as it's quite huge managing a business and trying to fit it in part time, I am grateful that I get to learn so much. And I also have the connection with Marcus and the camels. And it's that space between, that holy ground of intangible connection between partners that we try to honour. Alice has presented me with amazing work opportunities that hardly feel like work half the time because they're too interesting and creative. In 1997, when due to necessity I was acting coordinator of MPY Women's Council, I realised that I will be more content in a career that is creative rather than the slog of being a manager. From then on, I allow that decision to guide what work I choose to do. My good young Kanzara friend, Nora Ward, liked to joke that we should share one husband, Marcus, <laughs> because we are both short ladies. <clears throat> she directed that we record her life for her grandchildren. So we did that over 10 years, alongside Linda Riv and Suzanne Bryce, both exceptional interviewers, interpreters, and storytellers. And in particular, Linda's gift in translation that honors Nora's word on the page. Ninu Grandmother's Law, the autobiography of Nora Nungalka Ward, was published by Magabala in 2018. Sadly, Nora had passed away by then. Here's me at Kalka on the Pitandara lands, working on our Eritija. One of my early roles was to train Anangu on how to navigate our Eritija and write in stories and names of their families onto photos within the social history archive. Outstanding moments at Ara Eritija was when someone would come in from stolen generations trying to find their family and like detectives at work, we would scour through thousands of photos trying to get enough leads to find where their family may have been. And if we were lucky, we would find a photo of their mum holding them as a baby. Five minutes. From 2014 for six years, I worked at Land Council on discrete projects in land management. My brief was to create a bilingual digital storybook that presented the operational and management plan for Southern Tanami Indigenous Protected Area. And we went on to make one for the Northern Tanami IPA as well. These digital storybooks contain short videos, animations, seasonal calendars, interactive maps about land types in Jukupa, wall print knowledge interactives, and plant and animal cards. In total, I think we made close to 90 mini documentaries. The program had to be developed for the web, for smartphones, and with an offline version 
available for people without internet access. As an audio navigated website in both Walpree and English, any written word also had to be spoken in an effort to overcome literacy issues. The brief was visionary but not practical, so it took a while working part-time to research what was possible. Nothing existed on the shelf, so I had to create the digital storybook from scratch. I was extremely fortunate that my Walpre partner, Madeleine Napanati Dixon, is a great thinker outside of the square and patient, and endlessly patient with my, what if we made it? And that the Rangers and the IPA committees were adventurous about making something different, greater than, for example, a, a talking poster. Personally, it's the process of making things collaboratively and with integrity that touches me rather than some final product. When I first started at the CLC working with the Walpreys, it was hard as I'd only worked with Lanadara, Pitandara, Yankandara people. And when I finished that IPA work, I said to Nangala, the Walpree director, what should I do now? I don't only want to work at the camel farm. Any good ideas? And she said, Napanunka, you should go back and work with those Pitandaras. <laughs> and that's where you'll find me now if I'm not with the camels, because just like Alice Springs synchronicity, a role turned up. I'm part of the, down the bottom is the Walpree digital storybook from the um, Northern Tanami IPA and some other books I've worked at, a few of the other books I've worked at over the years here in Central Australia. Today I'm part of the Clear Thinking Project at Women's Council, Oti Kulunjaku, led by a group of Anangal women leaders who clear think their way about mental health. It's within the Nankari Traditional Healer Program that I worked with back in 2000 and wrote the original funding submission. One of my focus areas at Uri Kulanjaku has been making meditations, and that's pure joy to me. The meditation journey with these women has been very deep and rewarding. And meditation has resonance with many of the Uri Kulanjaku women. The latest meditation relies on memory and is written specifically for women at the Alice Springs Jail. Sometime in the last decade, a person who I grew up with in Sydney and respect highly said to me, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> I've thought quite a bit about that question. And I think, what can be more real than to work with First Nations women who have instilled their core values into my being? Values such as strength, respect, peaceful and calm and kind-hearted, among others. And although I'm not at the same stage as that, as that friend, who, as a result of her life choices, has just taken early retirement from a senior management position with one of the four big banks. <laughs> I feel that my career and my life journey has suited my values and been incredibly joyful. There are so many people who have kept me in Central Australia and it's often because I've worked with them. Being here has also nurtured my yoga practice that I've been doing for more than two thirds of my life. It's that constancy. And I thank all those yoga buddies who are some in the audience who've been part of that journey. And it's the big blue sky, it's the fresh air, it's our home at White Gums with the red tailed black cockatoos. It's the camels, it's the lifestyle. And as I reflect that our children are now 15 and 18 and that you may see the daughter at Bunnings or the son, a lifeguard, at the Alice Springs pool, that I realise I've created my own unconventional, joyful lifestyle, surrounded by wonderful family, friends and community. And this is not a dress rehearsal for life. This is life.
Thanks. So even when we think we know someone, there's so much more. <laughs> I can cry like you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the joy of who we know in this town. Orsa, Orsa is the final speaker today, introducing her. Sometimes when people come from Africa, from England, from wherever, in Orsa's case, from Sweden, you think there must be a big story in landing here. She has her own, so thanks to her. Okay, how do I follow that? <laughs> There's one more live to listen to, guys. Um, so I start at the Commons where Marcus left off. I walk a lot. I do a lot of bushwalking and walking from town across the commons to White Gum is one of the favourite ones. New things every time to uh, discover. Uh, I pay my respect to the Aranda traditional owners of the town area and I also want to warn that one of my slides have um, photos of Aboriginal people who have died. I have permission to show them but still want to warn anyone if they want to avoid that. So I'm from Sweden as Anne said. Uh, I emigrated to Australia 34 years ago, and I lived in Alice Springs for the past 23, 23 years. And I talk first by my own living history, and then about my research into the living histories of people here in town and Central Australia. So I was one of six children, uh, grew up in a town the same size as Alice. Um, we lived on the mountainside, and. I roam the forests on foot in summer, skis in winter, I rode horses a lot all year round. Uh, the town was a pretty rough place, um, dominated by a Volvo engine factory, a big concrete factory and three military barracks. So we had many work migrants from uh, men, usually, from Finland and from Yugoslavia and many young men who did the mandatory military service. So there was a lot of hard drinking in that town, a lot of hard working people, and hard living, a lot of violence and broken families in the, my, among my friends. I left home at 16, um, and I, that was the time I also went from riding horses to riding, riding my, motorbikes. Um, so I worked to pay rent and to take myself through college. Um, and besides music and writing, which has been constant in my life and in my family too, driving and rebuilding motorbikes uh, was my passion for years. The tight group of me and my uh, girlfriend, um, we were the first women in that town actually riding heavy bikes and rode in a tight group of male bikers um, and they kind of became our new family for many years. Guys who were tradies, worked at the Volvo factory, and apart from my brother, my oldest brother, I knew of no one in that town who had gone to university. But I did. I thought that this is uh, from reading books from all over the world from an early age. I wanted to see more of the world and I don't, didn't want to be stuck and work at Volvo for the rest of my life. So I left for the big city of Gothenburg and uh, graduated in journalism a few years later. Um, soon after that, I left for Australia, and went from Jutta River in Gothenburg to Todd River in Alice Springs. <laughs> uh, I spent a year hitchhiking around and took buses sometimes too. I thought hitchhiking was the best way to get to know Australians, and I had wonderful experiences. I still have friends from my hitchhiking around the country. I was most part of Australia. But I actually first then set my foot in Alice Springs in a frosty morning in July 1983. 
I arrived on a night bus from Darwin, dressed in a singlet, jean skirt, and thongs. <laughs> and I almost was to death stepping out of that bus. I just stepped right back on and convinced the driver to let me stay on the warm bus. And I ended up at Uluru that afternoon because that's where the bus went to. <laughs> uh, so I had a bit of time to uh, uh, be acclimatized. And when I returned to Alice, I was properly dressed. And I stayed around for a couple of weeks, and I was just blown out by the space here and the all geological kind of age of these mountains and these places here. And that was where my des passion for deserts began. I've been to many other deserts, but this is unique how old it is and the space and the skies that we've heard about and you all know about. Uh, that first year in Australia was also the first time in my life that I had warm feet and hands 24 7. For days after day, I could not believe that was possible. It was a bliss, and that was another reason uh, I knew I wanted to come back and live in Australia. In the meantime, back in Sweden, I, um, I then lived in Stockholm, and I wrote this book about Australia, a journalistic, photojournalistic book. Um, and I worked as a journalist, um, and I soon started my own freelance firm specializing in international development, human rights, women's rights, and regional conflicts, civil war areas, in what then was called the third world, now usually called the developing world. So in my 14, 15 years as a journalist, I wrote stories, photographed, and made radio documentaries for Swedish media from Southeast Asia, South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Laos, the Cambodian border, the rest of Southeast Asia and the Middle East uh, and the United States and uh, there's a few other places I haven't put it up, New Zealand <laughs> and a few other places. And it's completely wacko to put all this into one slide because all of these places have become very familiar to me. I did all the research in on the politics, the economy of these places, the cultural kind of traditions, music always, that I always try to catch up on too. And I spent longer times in there, some of the places I went back to many times. So they are, the dynamics in each place became very familiar to me. So they are like bubbles in my life. I see them sometimes uh, when I, you know, when that is part of my life, but you can't always share with people who haven't been there. Now, all this work made me realize that human beings everywhere have some basic desires and needs everywhere, and they have it in common. I mean, they have music traditions, that's one of the things, but also to belong and to feel safe. And most other things in life sort of comes out of that. But then how you come to belong in meaningful ways, that differs from place to place, shaped by particular sets of cultural beliefs, particular ways of organizing your social relations and practices. And this fascinates me. And from an early age, reading all these books, uh, many places and people in the world, um, this was fascinating, to step out of myself and see the world from other people's point of view, people who were not like me. And I wanted to stay longer, always when I was out as a journalist, even though I stayed long for a journalist. Uh, I wanted to learn how everyday life looked at and how that life from, other, from their point of view. Uh, it challenged you, because to understand that, you have to understand basic sets of values, ideas, um, practice and traditions, and the broader forces that shape those point of views. And that was always the driving force in my journalism. I did feature journalism, not so much news and things like that, and documentaries. Um, and it was also my, later in my anthropological work, why I became an anthropologist. I returned to that. Finally, then, I had worked on getting back to Australia, and I finally got my permanent residency and migrated in 1988, settled in Fremantle on the West Coast, and I worked as a freelancing um, Australian foreign, cons foreign correspondent for Swedish media. I regularly traveled to the East Coast, of course, to cover stories, and I always used my frequent fly points to come back via Alice Springs and spend a few a week, two weeks here, driving around, do a lot of bushwalking, trying to catch up on the music that happened here. Um, and then in the um, mid-1990s, I went back to Sweden, to Stockholm, to work on a collection of short stories with the publisher there. And I planned to stay max a year. I worked at the Swedish uh, equivalent to the ABC, Radio National, 
the Swedish radio in news and current affairs. Current affairs. I still looked for ways to, to get back and stay longer in foreign places. Uh, I was offered a job as a media officer with UNICEF in Bangkok, uh, but I didn't want to sit in office. I wanted to be on the ground and with people and see how everyday life it was. And I was told that I needed a degree in social anthropology to get those kind of jobs. So gradually, I changed careers, I uh, left my job as a well-paid then senior journalist, went back to university, and I completely fell in love with social anthropology for its very holistic view of things, staying for a long time to really understand how people see uh, things in the world. Uh, I completed an honours degree and then I went on to do a master's. And I did my fieldwork in Uganda, uh, in rural Uganda. I was looking at the new constitution in Uganda, which says, states that a third of all elected council from village up to the national level has to be women. So I went there to see, okay, does that mean that men just put women in there, brothers and you know, or fathers, and they just sort of speak for the men, or does it actually mean that other things in gender relations change? Uh, that, my master thesis led to the Swedish International Development Agency hiring me to lead a research team, a consultancy team, for a report on the state of democratic institutions, human rights, and peace, because there's a lot of civil war and war uh, going on in Uganda for many decades. So I returned a few times to Uganda. I got to know the place pretty well. I went to most parts of the country uh, and learned how locals actually had lived through these many decades of very violent regimes. AIDS almost wiped out a whole generation. Some places I went to only really had kids under 10, 15, and all the people, all the rest had died in AIDS. And up north, of course, uh, it was about kids being kidnapped uh, and then trying to be killing machines, basically, uh, by the rebels up north. So it's pretty harsh uh, life there, but still a lot of joy, a lot of music always as well. So that was another part of my life that became very familiar. But by now, I was really itching to get back to Australia. But out of the blue, my mum had a stroke, a major stroke, so I stayed on and I started a PhD at the Stockholm University while she got better. And then finally, I arrived back in May 2000 and pretty soon traveled to Alice to see how I could do my PhD field research here. And I'm still here. I haven't left. So I moved my PhD project to the Australian National University in Canberra. I did my field research up here for 15 months. And that was with rock, reggae, and country musicians, Aboriginal country musicians, across the desert region, to understand how music is a medium for negotiating um, uh, and expressing contemporary lives. I, especially with music, because it borrows and it steals and everything. And you travel around with music, you meet many other worlds that you engage with. And how did that shape these guys' view of the world and themselves? You can read all about it in that book there on the end, uh, which is from this research. I think they have it at Alice Springs Library, or you can you know, buy it online. Uh, but basically, I followed the musicians wherever they made music, when they rehearsed, when they uh, played and performed their music, out in desert communities, uh, in the recording studio, and on tours in the territory, but also in the state. Uh, and because that was almost an exclusively male world of music making, there were of course many women in the audience and things, but in the making itself, it also became a study of how, of how Aboriginal men negotiate different ways of being men in their and through their music work. Now after that, I'll go over this quite quick I guess, uh, I worked at, as a regional anthropologist and at the Land Council, we have many points meeting up here. Uh, and I was resp responsible for the research with um, traditional, senior traditional owners uh, on their connections to country in the whole vast region south of Alice Springs, that way it is. Uh, down to the border and then uh, South Australia border and almost to Mutujulu, but on this side of that. Uh, and uh, then I was asked to come down to ANU to teach uh, for a year, so I commuted on ca to Canberra for a year. And after that, I worked at Bachelor Institute for Tertiary Education, where I met uh, Anne the first time. 
I had met Bill already through the music research. Uh, and at Bachelor, I was a lecturer in social sciences and then an academic manager, rewriting their higher degrees. And from these jobs here in different places here in Alice Springs, I gained a lot of insights into the great diversity of indigenous people in this town. Everything from higher educated people from other places who come here to work, to bush mob who come in who speak four other languages and organize their daily routines very differently from other kind of, from the town people as well, who grew up and always lived here. Uh, during this time, to, I developed a new research project that I wanted to look at these relationships in the town of Alice Springs itself. Uh, so, and I managed to get um, funding from the Australia Research Council for that. And then after that finished, I again commuted long term, a long distance, this time five years, uh, when I was working as a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney and the researcher there until just before COVID hit. But I want to go back to the Alice Springs research project. So in that research, I investigated how the great diversity of people who live here form a sense of belonging in this town, both in the way they form attachments to particular other people and how they form attachment to the physical environment, both the built environment and the desert environment in this particular place. And there were two main things that motivated me to do this research. The first is that Alice Springs mostly is portrayed in media, national media, research, national public debate, in black and white terms as a divided town, uh, with the main divisions being that between indigenous and non-indigenous people. And that had not been my experience living here in my day-to-day -day life and work. Sorry, here. I see people from so many different ethnic, national, language backgrounds with different kinds of education, different faith, professions, age, gender and so on, constantly interact here. In workplaces, schools, in public space, sports clubs, churches, pubs, at the hospital, in shops, neighbourhoods and so on. Uh, and my second motivation in the project was that, like me in my previous research and work, uh, anthropologists have mainly or only focused on indigenous people's experiences and forms of belonging in this region and in town. I also wanted to know how the 80% majority of residents here who are not indigenous experience and belong in this place and come to belong here all the time. So I did long interviews, had long conversations with lots of town residents from all walks of life, profession, ages, ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds, and so forth. Uh, about their histories and their daily activities and relationships in and to this town. I participated in a range of community activities, groups and events. I mapped how different people use and move about in town space uh, at different times of day and at week, and, and different times of the week, to see how they cross paths or not in town and who they engage with in, when they did this. I followed the work of the town council very closely um, and sat down with, uh, for long conversations with all the elected councillors and with key council staff because they make and enact, dis enact decisions about the management of town space. And I of course talked about town businesses, the chamber of commerce and so on, and did historical research on the town. Uh, talk to members of long-standing families who literally built this town and its infra infrastructure. And by starting from how residents here come to belong, uh, in what ways they do that, and not from them being indigenous or non-indigenous, I found that a very important factor for how people understand themselves as different and similar or similar to certain other people has a lot to do with um, their levels and kind of education and training and the kind of work they are in and the particular kinds of knowledge, values, experiences and aspirations associated with this. So this is basically about what we social scientists talk about as class uh, in a more extended way. And that may partly map on to being indigenous and or non-indigenous, but in many instances it doesn't. Uh, but that's where I found when people move around, for example, that some people don't cross paths in this town at all, almost, in the events and the different activities going on. And that was the basis for what I could see in those people, why that never really crossed paths. Another big um, factor that I saw is, has about, is about 
time, how long people have lived here, of course, uh, but also what time they came here, in what time in history they came here. So, for example, if, you, if you're fourth or fifth generation born and bred in town or the region, you will understand town affairs and relationships here differently, how they have developed over time, than people do who moved here more recently, of course. And people who came here in the 70s, the 80s, will look differently at things in town from those who arrived here in the past two decades, for example. And of course, all these other things too, where people come from in Australia or overseas, their particular life experiences and they are major factors too. I don't want to go into all the details because it becomes a bit too much, but um, you can go to my website if you want, you can download articles I've written about this and on the music research too if you're interested in that. Uh, uh, but an important thing to remember and that anthropology and history can show us uh, is that different cultural values and beliefs that shape our relations and actions here in town is that they're never fixed. It isn't anywhere, of course. They always keep changing as we gain new experiences every day in our interactions with other people, as we learn new things, uh, and um, as broader national and global forces change, of course. And this might all sound very like common sense. But the rich and always changing um, diversity and common interests and differences, both within and across uh, groupings of people here in town, that is not often considered in policy making and other structural responses to problems we have here or when planning for the town's future. Yet that is the lived reality in our local living histories, both individual and collective ones, that there are ongoing, always unfinished processes, and we all take part in shaping how we come to belong and feel safe in this place. And in that open-ended spirit, I'll stop talking. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks to Liz and Anita doing the work of Friends of Araluan to make it possible this afternoon. Thanks to you all for coming, filling up, warming up this space, and thanks in particular for these four rich, wonderful stories, and see you next time.